praise and worship. Woo! You know, praise, just a reminder, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if, if, if which one would be more coveted by God. Uh, I'm sure that they are both uh, coveted. We're to praise the Lord, and we're to, and we're to worship the Lord, and yeah. praise means to brag on Him. And worship is, means, everybody say, worth-ship. worth-ship. Worship means uh, why he's worth praising. <laughs> you know, when we, when we say, holy, 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 that's praise. Great, because great is your mercy, that's worship. Praise on, pra, uh, to praise him is to brag on him, and to worship him means tell him why he's worth bragging on, you know. So anyway, that's a combination, and I enjoy an opportunity to both praise and worship for something that leads me both to not only brag on Jesus, but also to tell everybody why he's worth being bragged about, you know. And we're, uh, we're moving right along in the book of Revelation. Is uh, everybody okay still? You, you, you hanging in? You hanging in? I, I know we've, you know we've gone far enough now where... You've begun to see the action of the book and what's going on in the book, and I hope that you keep in mind that the book's about Jesus Christ. I know it comes up in these uh, Star Wars kind of pictures and subjects, and you're led into all kind of uh, uh, images and symbols, and, uh, and some of them are purely symbolic, and some of them are actual literal things. And one of the big questions about today's message, I know in people's minds, would be when these trumpets start blowing, are those, really, are those real things that happen on the earth, like literal things that happen on the earth, or are they symbolic of something else? They just kind of symbolize some things that go on on earth, and they have other meanings besides exactly what they're saying. Is God just trying to use symbols to show us uh, catastrophically something that has happened? And my answer to that, and you always have to be really careful now when you try to start interpreting things like the book of Revelation or any of the prophecy of the Bible, uh, because... We have limited understanding of things, and we have we don't have full insight of everything. So don't I'm just saying, don't you stand before Jesus one day, and 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 say, my pastor said so and so and so, because uh, I know this is going to shock you, but I could be wrong about some of these things. Yeah, I could be wrong about some of these things, but I'm going to give you what I feel uh, that I'm led by the Lord to give you, and. Uh, and what 40 years of study in this and all this will do, uh, I believe that when we look today at these seven trumpets that begin to blow, because, you know, we've come so far, we've come past the sixth seal. You remember what's going on in the essence of the story of Revelation? Uh, we've seen, uh, in, we, we've been called up to heaven in the fourth chapter, and we've seen a throne of God, and around this throne are angels, and, and there are some of them that are flying, and they have six wings, and they have four faces, and they're crying out, holy, 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 and then there are 24 elders that are sitting on thrones, uh, and they're robed in white robes, and they're casting their crowns down before Jesus, because uh, Jesus, had, they've already gone through the judgment seat of Christ uh, because they've got the crowns. I mean, if, you, if, they, if they hadn't gone through the judge, they wouldn't have the crowns yet. So some of the things that we're looking forward to when we get to heaven, it will have already happened by the time this action that you're seeing now starts happening. So we're there. We got, we've been through the judgment seat of Christ, which judges us not as to whether we're lost or saved. Look at your neighbor and say, if you're not saved, you won't be there. I mean, come on, come on. If you're not saved, you won't be there. So we're not talking about whether you're saved or lost, because if you're not saved, you won't be at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ does not judge whether you're lost or saved. It judges how well you did with what God gave you to work with while you were here on earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells you all about it, and it talks about... Uh, that we'll stand before Jesus and he will judge our works uh, as to, and here's the exact phrase, of what sort they are. Not how many they are or how big they are or how much, but of what kind. In other words, what did you do with God gave, with what God gave you to work with? You're not going to be judged one day before the Lord as to whether you did good with what he gave me 
or I did good with what he gave you, he's going to look at you and say, what did you do with what I gave you to do with? And then if you've been faithful, Corinthians says, you're going to receive a crown. And this crown is going to be a worthy thing. It's like, the, it's like an Olympic crown. It's the crown of a champion, not the crown of a king. And this Olympic crown is going to be valuable because it shows that you have been faithful over some section of life. And there are five of these crowns that are mentioned in the Bible. And you're going to get at least one of them or you're, or you're not going to be standing there, you know. You're going to get the crown of life, uh, which I would think would be uh, that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. So you're going to get at least one crown, but whether you get more or not, it's based on what you do with what he gave you to do. Have you been faithful? Have you given it all to him? Have you worked hard? Have you uh, been obedient? Have you sacrificed? Have you obeyed? Is your body a living sacrifice to the Lord? Are you clean? Are you right? Are you holy? I mean, these are kind of things that'll get crowns, you know, one day you stand before the Lord. So anyway, these elders already have their crowns and they're casting them at the I mean, the picture we get is this gigantic worship service in heaven where angels are moving and flying and well, holy, 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 and, and uh, around the throne, the, the, the elders are, yeah, you know, and they're worshiping the Lord, and there's just noise, noise, and blasting and pray. I mean, you think our sound is loud here, brother. I mean, it is nothing compared to what heaven's going to be. I mean, and for, and for two whole chapters, we got... What is heaven like? Boy, it's noisy is all I'm going to say to you because, I mean, the people are, that are there and the angels that are there and, 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 the, and, the, and, and, and the Lamb and the, and, the, and the Father and the Holy Spirit and the atmosphere is electric and just flying with praise and worship everywhere and it's just noise all the time and worship and praise and adoration and all of that are going on and, and then they begin to break some seals. And they break six seals. You remember the first four give us horsemen that ride out. And they, got, they have these things that start happening on earth. Uh, things that are already happening that you can see every day. But, but they just intensify. They, they're loosed. They have no restraint on them. And I know we're looking at things happen today that I'm wondering where is the restraint you know, right now. I can't imagine it being any worse than it is, but according to the Bible, it's, it is going to get worse, and it's going to get way worse than it is now because Jesus, in talking about these days that we live in in Matthew 24, read it, uh, said that all of these things, these wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilences and plagues and all that, he said these, these are only the beginning of sorrows. Man, these aren't, Jesus said, you think, you think that's bad, you wait, it's going to get way worse than that. Well, you remember how bad it got when the sixth seal was broken the men of this earth thought, this has got to be the end of life. <laughs> and they began to run to the mountains and the caves. And they hid in the caves and hid under the rocks of the mountains. And they cried out for the mountains to fall on them. To hide them from the face of, of the Lamb of God. And Jesus said, uh-uh, brother, you think, you think this is the end? This is not the end. This is only the beginning because we have seven trumpets that have yet to sound. And with each trumpet, it gets more and more intense and more and more intense. Because with the trumpet sounding, the devil is loosed. Satan is loosed to ravish this earth. The seals are men doing evil things, just intensified evil things. I mean, it's men hurting men. It's, it's the restraint being removed and people uh, uh, dominating people and hurting people. When the seven trumpets began blowing, all, all of a sudden the earth is in jeopardy. The, the, the actual physical earth that we live on. All of the things that we depend on. All of the things that we look at to give us life, health, stability, uh, wherewithal. I mean, God begins to shake this very earth. The earth becomes uh, whoo, in the balance as demons from the pit are released and Satan is released. And then Satan plays his trump card. He brings up a superman. Whoo, called the 
beast in many places in the book of Revelation. We call him by another name many times, the Antichrist. So if you, when you see, and we'll read them, and when you see the word and the beast, it means the Antichrist. There are three entities that are satanic entities in the book. One is the beast, called the Antichrist. One is the false prophet, which is the anti-Holy Spirit. And the other is the dragon, which is the anti-Father God. So just like there, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, the devil imitates God, and he is the daddy demon, the Holy Spirit demon, and the Jesus demon, the Antichrist, the dragon, and the false prophet. And so all of these things begin to be released, and, and this happens with the trumpets that begin to blow in the eighth chapter. Let's just see if we can go through this, all right? Because it's going to be very interesting what God does. Look, look at what happens when he opened the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and, and, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, and noises, and no, there was noises, uh, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. And, there, and they were thrown to the earth, and the third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa! 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Woo! Let the good times roll. I mean, come on, sounds like fun to me, right? <laughs> yeah, where's the party? Where's the party? Yeah, come on, man. I tell you, one of the reasons, and, and this is just kind of giving a vouch and giving a word for the Word of God, is one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is God's holy word is because it is the only writing on the face of the earth. It is the only religious writing. It's the only writing anywhere that has in it a word of prophecy. And you know what prophecy is? Prophecy is writing history before it happens. And, and, and these other writers of these other human books these books of other religions, these Confucius's, these uh, uh, Hindus, these Muslims, these uh, uh, Eastern religions, these uh, crazy cults of America, these, uh, these, these other writers that write books that are supposed to be Bibles and guides and, and inspired writings and so forth. There's one thing they don't have in them, and that is any word of prophecy. You know why? Because the writers of these human books know that once they put in a word of prophecy and it doesn't happen, then they'll be declared false prophets and their books will be banned and burned. But the Bible, the holy word of God with daring and boldness tells us 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 6,000 years into the future what will happen to men to people, to nations, to groups on this earth. And when it speaks of these prophecies, it's always right. 
Now, I know that the Bible is not a book of science. It is not a book of, of, uh, of medicine. It, it, it's not a book of history. But when it speaks on these things, it's always right. And it has been found many times to be true that once scientists laugh at things, they mock things, they ridicule some of the things the Bible says, and, and they come out with their institutions and their, and their learned scholars and say, that's a joke, the Bible is ridiculous, there could never be any fire and brimstone that fall out of heaven, and there couldn't be two cities burned up called Sodom and Gomorrah on the banks of the Dead Sea somewhere over there. Well, that was until a few years ago, they found two cities over there burned up with sulfur-like material, and <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah, there they are. They're only about like 25 feet underground, but they found them. And I'm just telling you, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar, and that is what exactly what it is. Anytime the Bible says it's true, it's true. And if men will find the truth, they will find that they're the ones that have been wrong and God's been true all along. And so on these events that are happening here, as far as an interpretation of them go, whether they're figurative or literal, I'm just going to have to let the Bible translate the Bible for us. To trust the Bible to tell us, is this literal stuff or is this symbolic stuff? And we have some literal things in the Bible that we can compare to these end time things. I know they sound like, you know, fantastic uh, uh, Star Wars. Uh, uh, you know, this sounds like some kind of a novel written by somebody that had some kind of supernatural stuff going on in it. But the Bible says there's, there have been things like this that have happened before. Not as big, not as broad, not talking about a third of the earth and a third of the ships and a third of everything. But it surely imitates several of the things. As a matter of fact, five of the ten plagues that fell on the nation of Egypt when God sent Moses down to Egypt to bring out the Jews from Egyptian captivity. You remember Moses had the rod of God, and God said, wave that rod over the waters, and the waters will become blood. And the whole, the whole Nile River, when, when Moses said, you let my people go, and Pharaoh said, ha, I'm not letting it go. And he said, all right, well, God told me to do this. And he reaches out his, his, his rod, and the, it's the rod of God, and, he, and, the, and the water becomes blood. And then, he, and then he does another one, and then the frogs come out, and locusts come down. I mean, it's a tremendous thing. The ninth thing happens, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars are affected by it and light and all that, and, the day, and it grows dark for three days, and it's so black, dark, the Bible says they can't see their hand in front of their face, and it's just terrible. And yet Pharaoh's heart still stays hard, and he won't let the people go, and then the last thing was, you know, the death of the firstborn. And that's where he put the blood over the doors of the firstborn of Israel and the death angel passed over and that created Passover. That's what the word means, that God's death angel passed over them because they had blood, the blood of the innocent shed for the guilty around the doorpost. Well, this is a bigger version of that. It's like, okay, when Moses did it in, in, in Egypt, was it? Figurative or was it symbolic? Was it real? Was it literal? Or was it just a picture of something? Well, it was real. It actually really changed things on the earth. So based on that, I'm believing that these things are just like God say they are. I mean, the star doesn't represent the fall of government and the earth burning up is not the structures of democracy falling down and some politician being one of the wormwoods. And I'm, no, 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 no. Too, too messed up, too, too confusing. It's exactly what God says it is. And God describes what happens on this earth after things are gone. And he says, man, you know, this is a tremendous thing. And to prove it, the first thing that happens is in the, in the first verse, remember we've had six seals that have broken. We're waiting for that seventh seal to break. And, and, and the Bible says when he opened that seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Oh my goodness, man. Woo! I mean, silence is golden, right? Mm -hmm. 
15 seconds. 15 seconds of silence. Felt a little funny, didn't you? You started looking around and say, Lord, does he having a stroke or what? <laughs> I've never heard him be quiet for 15 seconds. <laughs> 15 seconds, guys. Here's 30 minutes. 30 minutes of silence in the atmosphere of heaven. This is directly contrary to the atmosphere of heaven. The atmosphere of heaven is noisy. The atmosphere of heaven is loud. The atmosphere of heaven have been angels flying and elders screaming and angels worshiping and voices crying out, holy, holy, and crowns falling and, 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 and just praise and worship and adoration and noise going everywhere. And then all of a sudden, buddy, when that seventh seal is open, boom, you know, we have a, we have a, we have a scroll that has seven seals and the first one breaks and a, and a, and a white horse and then the second one breaks and a red horse, second one, third one, a black horse, a fourth one, a pale horse, a death horse, colored horse, and then a fifth one, we got some souls on under an altar that are crying out, God, how long are you going to let this happen? A sixth seal breaks and the, and the people run and cry for the mountains to fall down them. And then when that seventh seal opens up, boom, whoo, 30 minutes of awesomeness, uh, reverence, uh, fear, shock. What in the world would make heaven be quiet? For 30 minutes. Only thing I can think of is those people around the throne, those angels, those beings, those elders, those us. Yee, we get a little peek when he breaks that seventh seal of what's going to happen with these other seven trumpets and seven vials. And it's so horrible that we're just broken in like, <gasps> in stunned shock. Have you ever had any news that just stuns you like that? Ooh, your mouth gets dry. You feel funny back there, like, you know, and it just vaporizes all the moisture within your mouth. It just shocks you so bad. I'm picturing that's what happens in heaven because whatever's about to be released, they see it. I mean, they're standing right there at the throne. And all of a sudden, that scroll opens up, and then it must have been like a flash of what's coming next, and, whoo, and then they go, oh, God, this is something else. An awesomeness and a silence that you can't help but notice. You're not going to get past this. This is one of those things where God just kind of gives a little uh, preview of what is to come. And it calls attention to the fact that God is doing it. No way for you to miss this. Is this a coincidence? This is what those scientists were talking about. Oh, we should have signed that Paris uh, Global Accord. Holy Ghost. Now, because we pulled out of the Paris Weather Treaty junk, uh, now the whole uh, cosmos is mad at us and they're throwing rocks at us and everything. No, 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 you're not going to think that because it's going to be so awesome that be so quiet and be so devastating. There's no way for anybody to think anybody but God is doing this. But before he moves on to the actual sounding of the trumpets, he gives us one more little praise scene in heaven. It's almost like he can't help it, you know. It's like, well, before we move to disaster, let me just show you what's happening in heaven because as soon as that seventh seal's open, it, it's going to be quiet for about 30 minutes. And then notice what happens. And I, saw the, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God. No big deal here. Just want to point out to you, these, these seven angels didn't have to be called for. They, it wasn't like, oh, God said, okay, seven angels, come on in now. It's your time. They're already there. They're already standing in front of the throne. They're already prepared, which tells me that God has them ready to do whatever they do. And their job is to stand there and wait until God says, okay, boys, get your trumpets. And they're already present. And, he, and, and, and to them were given seven trumpets. And then another angel, an eighth angel, uh, having a golden censer came and stood at the altar he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. 
Now, let me show you something here because I, I want to give you a picture, and I'm not going to dwell on this, all right? But I do want you to kind of get a little visual in your mind because uh, the altars talked about and the golden altar and the incense and the, and the fragrance going up into the nostrils of God, and it's talking about this. This is, this is the Old Testament tabernacle that Moses, this was the worship center that traveled with Israel when they went through the desert and went into the promised land that later became the same pattern for the temple, the temple in Jerusalem and Solomon's temple and all of those things. But here, here's, here's the example. And you'll notice in this top picture that there's a tent around, I mean, there's a fence around a certain area and that's called the outer court. When you came, there was only one way in. You see going in the front right there, there's an opening and you go right in there and the first piece of furniture that you come to is called the altar. That altar is made out of brass or bronze. Bronze and brass always represent judgment. So the first thing you encounter is a big brass altar. This big brass altar, and you'll notice in the small picture right here below, that's kind of a close-up of that big brass altar. And what happens is they built a fire in it, and then they take the sacrifice and those little horns on all the four corners. They, 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 they slit the throat of the, of the animal, and they hang it on that horn, and the blood drips down into those coals of that fire, and it creates smoke that starts going up like this. And it's a smoke of judgment because it's being burnt in a brass altar. And so the sacrifice is made so that sins can be postponed. This is an act of repentance and, it, and, and it's judgment. So that's the altar. And then that next piece of furniture in the top picture is the brazen or the brass laver, the brass sink where you wash your hands and wash your life so you can be clean because when you go through the door of that smaller tent on the inside, you walk into what is called the inner court. And in there, I'm not sure if you can see... Uh, every piece of furniture, but there are three pieces of furniture in there. The one directly in front of you, if you walked in the door, standing directly in front of you is a small golden altar, which is this one right over here. And in that altar, they would take some of the coals from out of the big altar outside. They would bring it in in a, in a, in a sensor, which is like a shovel. If, you were, if you've ever worked with a fireplace, sometimes you have that little pan that hangs down and you, and you put, you know, brushed up and then it, it kind of comes underneath and you can carry it somewhere and they carry it and they put coals on the top of this altar. See like this right here? And then the, the, then the priest takes chips of wood that have been soaked with sweet smelling incense and fragrance and then when the coals are there, then he, start, he puts that wood on top of that coals and it starts making smoke go up and that smoke is flavored and scented because of the scented chips of wood and it's called the altar of incense and it just goes up and it goes and it creates a cloud in there and it begins to penetrate through and it begins to go up and, and, and it is said by Jewish custom now, I'm, uh, 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 a, uh, a Jewish priest said this to me, he said what they teach is that as that smoke goes up and as the altar smoke goes up, that smoke, if it goes straight up, it means your sacrifice is not good. It means somebody lied, somebody didn't do, but when you see that, when you see that smoke just kind of begin to get sucked into the air, like, like this, it means that God has, has sucked it in and it's an acceptable sacrifice to God. So whenever we're talking about this in the book of Revelation, this is what it's talking about. The altar is the brass altar that sits outside that has a fire built in it. That is the, that is the altar of judgment. It's where the sacrifice is made and, and all of that. And then the, the golden altar, all the, all the furniture on the outside is made of brass. It means judgment. All the furniture on the inside is made of gold, which means glory. So if you're on the outside, you're in the judgment. If you come on in to the inside, you're in the glory of God. And God never <laughs> misses a trick. Don't stay outside in the judgment. Come on in to the inside for the glory. All right, now, so what has happened is uh, the priest has gone outside. This angel has gone outside. He's got a, he's got, he's got a sensor. He gets, the, gets some coals. He brings them in. He puts them on the altar of incense. And then uh, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints. Notice, and I don't want to be you know, too ticky about this, but just to call your attention to it, it doesn't say the prayer of certain saints, like the ones that are under the altar, or 
uh, any other kind of designation. It just says the prayers of the saints. The saints are us. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a saint. No, don't laugh. Don't laugh. <laughs> I know, no, no, don't, don't, don't laugh, no, don't laugh. It's like you're a saint. Oh, glory to God. Uh, well, you are a saint. Uh, you are a saint because Jesus has washed you clean. And before God, you stand clean because of the blood of the Lamb. That's why we call it amazing grace. You don't deserve it, you can't earn it. It's amazing because God gives it to you and it is so powerful, you know? Well, the saints have been praying. Have you ever prayed for God's judgment to fall on the wicked? Have you ever prayed for God's judgment to come against those who spat on Jesus, who persecute other Christians, including yourself, who kill people in the name of some religion and sacrifice group? I mean, have you ever said, Lord, when is your judgment going to fall on these desperately wicked people? God, how can this be right? Lord, you know, can you do something? This is, this is un, uh, unjust. This is not right. This is, I mean, you've been praying that. If you've ever prayed that, let me tell you where those prayers went. It went into a bucket in heaven. That's going to be given to an angel right about now at this point right here. And it says that this incense that is going up when this seventh seal is broken is somehow mingled with the prayers of the saints. All of the saints. Every prayer that has ever been prayed for judgment and justice and the integrity of God upon those who rejected Christ, who spit on the church, who neglect God in every way, who kill people in the name of Christ. I mean, all of those prayers that have ever been prayed by any saint in any century at any time has been collected because up until now, God can't answer those prayers because in an era of grace, God can't answer a prayer like that. But now we're way past the grace of God. We're in the judgment of God. And now those prayers that call for revenge can be answered in a time of judgment. And so now God takes those prayers and he starts mingling them with this incense and it becomes, uh, God gonna do it. God's gonna you know, take care of all of that stuff. And then the angel took the censer and he filled it with fire from the altar. So he goes back out to the altar of judgment where the fire is and he gets some coals on there and then he steps over here and he just flings it. And as he flings those coals down to earth, and they begin to hit earth. The Bible says something starts happening on earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. Woo! So the prayers go up to God. And what comes down from God? Judgment. And this judgment is signified by earthquakes and thunderings and lightnings and flashings. And oh my goodness, the earth. All of this worship, all of this stuff's going on in heaven, but it begins to react on the earth in physical ways. And so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared them to sound. You know, trumpets are associated with warfare, right? Many times in the Bible, when trumpets blew, it led armies to battle. I'll give you one little sign, one of them you'll remember. You remember in the book of Joshua, the first city that Israel came to in the Holy Land was a city called Jericho. Giant walled city, so big nobody could conquer. They said you could run seven chariots wide around the wall. That, I mean, that's a big wall. So God said to Israel or through Joshua, he said, all right, march them around the city on the first day. And he did one time and he said, do it again the second day. And he did one time and he did it like that for six days. And then on the seventh day, God said, all right, now march around the city seven times. And he marched around the city seven times. And he said, now, when you march around that seventh time, I'm going to give you a signal. And when I do, I want the priest to blow those shofars. And when they blow those shofars, the walls are going to come tumbling down. And on the seventh day, they marched seven times. And then all of a sudden, and the people said, holy, and the wall went, God performed a tremendous thing. So now we have seven angels again, seven trumpets. 
whoo, what a war this is going to be. This is going to be catastrophic. And so they prepare themselves to sound. And they're going to sound as God ordains them to sound. When he says, all right, next, then they're going to blow theirs. And then when he says, all right, uh, whoop, all right next, uh, blah, and then the angel's going to blow his. And there's seven of them. And let's look at the first one. The first trumpet, I've just labeled it, okay, this is a brewing storm. And here's, the, here's what happened. And the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and, there were thrown, and, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. So the Bible says, happening here on earth, when the first trumpet blows his trumpet, that there's going to be fire that falls out of heaven. Now, whether this fire is like sulfur and, 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 and molten lava and like it was with Sodom and Gomorrah when God gets sent, sent fire down to burn up those cities or whether it's lightning flashes and the great fire of lightnings and, uh, and thunderings. I, I don't know what it is. And it's got hail falling out of the skies. I don't know if these are little bits of asteroids or little bits of, of, uh, of space dust that have invaded the atmosphere. I, I don't know, but, but it's, it's physical enough to, that people know that it, stuff is beginning to fall on the earth and it's beginning to hit. And then the blood that's mingled with it, I don't know whether it's when one of those pieces of hail hits you, your blood pops out and it gets all mingled with it or whether it's falling out of the sky mingled with blood. But it, whatever it is, is so catastrophic that a third of the trees are burned up here on the earth and that things, you know, ecological disasters begin to happen in tremendous ways. Think about this. If the, if the tree, if a third of the trees are burned up and all of the green grass is burned up, think about what that means on earth. What kind of ecological disasters would this be? I put a few things in your note, you know. Um, if one-third of the, of the vegetation on the earth burns, imagine the Amazon rainforest, the African rainforest, the magnificent forest of Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks all burning at once. The results would be devastating. Air pollution, soil pollution, water contamination would be immediate. The remaining vegetation couldn't consume the carbon dioxide and other hothouse gases produced by modern civilization and history. And in other words, God has created a perfect balance on this earth. And I'm not sure, and I'm not like a scientist, and I'm not trying to preach science to you, but just to make this point to you, God has created a marvelous plan on this earth. God has created us who breathe air, all the animals, all of us, who breathe air is we breathe oxygen in, goes into our lungs, our lungs take the oxygen out, put it in our bloodstream, goes to our heart, feeds our bodies, blah, blah, and then we blow out, we blow out carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is not a, an unnatural gas. This is why this goofy... Uh, global junk is so funny because carbon dioxide, every one of us breathe it out every time we blow a breath out. It's a natural rhythm of God. Your dog does it. Your cat does it. Your, your hog does it. Your cow does it. Every, everything that breathes air does that. Well, guess what the genius of God has done? He has put green plants on this earth, green grass on this earth, green leaves on this earth. Guess what they like? They like carbon dioxide. They take carbon dioxide into themselves and they pump oxygen out. Whoo, what a marvelous genius God is. He puts a whole bunch of people on this earth that need oxygen and produce carbon dioxide, and he puts a whole bunch of green plants on this earth that take in carbon dioxide and put out oxygen. What a balance of life. Glory to God. God's a genius, you know. Hallelujah. The more carbon dioxide, the better the plants are going to grow. But when you take a third of all the green plants on this earth, man, oxygen's probably going to be scarce. A third of the plants on this earth? Whoo! Now, the population of the earth has decreased, you might make yourself aware, right? Because before the rapture, there are about 7 billion people. Right now, there are about 7 billion people on this earth, give or take a few million here or there. 
Well, I'm, I'm going to be generous, and I'm going to say a million people, a, a billion people get called up in the rapture. I mean, that's being generous now. But I don't know, I, I don't know who he is and who's not. That's left to God. That's management. I'm in the sales department, right? So I'm just going to say, all right, let's be gracious, and a billion people go to heaven when Jesus calls us up in the clouds. So now on earth, we have six billion people left, right? Well, a bunch of them have already died because they are souls under some altar in heaven saying, we've been martyred for our faith in Christ, and they, we've been killed because the Antichrist doesn't want us alive, messing up his plan, and we've received Christ, and we're going to be martyred for that. So maybe a half a billion or so. So we're down about five and a half billion on earth right now out of the original seven billion. And then in these trumpets, we're going to lose billions. We're going to lose thirds of this and thirds of that and thirds of that. So by the time the Antichrist is in complete control, there'll be about two billion people left on the earth. <laughs> I mean, really, it's going to get drastic real quick. But a third of the trees were burned up and a third of the green grass was burned up. Now, you remember I talked to you just a second about prophecy? I want you to just see what prophecy really is. Here's prophecy. Joel, an Old Testament prophet, writing 2,000 years before Jesus ever appeared on this earth, at least 2,000 years, before Jesus ever stepped foot. He wrote this in his, in his second chapter. And it shall come to pass afterward. This is that great prophecy that many people know who are spirit-filled and, you know, walk and, and look for spiritual life. This is that great prophecy. I just want to see that it didn't stop with those verses, okay? And it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Look at what he says. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. And the, as the Lord has said among the remnant who call, whom, whom the Lord calls. I just wanted you to see that Joel, the prophet, saw some of these same things happening to thousands of years before Jesus ever set on the scene. He said, let me tell you what it's going to be like one of these days. At the end of time, it's going to be like fire falling out of heaven, and hail falling out of heaven, smoke, earth burned up, moon, blood. I mean, it's going to be Wow. And imagine what those people that heard Joel say this in the Old Testament, they'd say, man, did he find that wacky plant that's been floating around over here? I mean, what happened to him? Has he been drinking too much? Where's the wine? Man, my goodness, give me some of that. No, this is the Spirit of God saying, wake up, people. This is what's coming. This is prophecy. This is writing history before it happens. I just want you to see God stays consistent. He told us that. And so this is going to be an ecological disaster on this earth, and it's going to be catastrophic for the earth. Now, the second trumpet sounds, and something else hits the earth. Then the second angel sounded. Now, and notice it, something like a great burn, a mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Now, I'm just calling your attention to the fact that, that John said, it, it, look, it looks like a a mountain fell in the sea. Something like a mountain that was burning. Like a burning mountain, you know, fell off in the sea. I think meteor. Think asteroid. Think something big like a mountain that breaks through our atmosphere and is set on fire like what happens when you come through the atmosphere. Have any of you seen the re-entry of any of these space capsules? You know, you've watched them and it's like... They have to have these heat shields because trying to get through the atmosphere of earth, you create so much friction that fire just engulfs. And thank the Lord that it does because most of the stuff that hits our atmosphere, it burns them up before it hits the earth. But this thing is so giant and gigantic that it hits the atmosphere and when it comes through, it's on fire and it still looks like a mountain. And boom, it's going to hit the sea. 
What sea? Well, the sea that's most often mentioned in the book of Revelation is the sea that's right around the Isle of Patmos, which is the Mediterranean Sea. However, I'm not really convinced that the Mediterranean Sea is big enough for this kind of event because look at what it says happened. I mean, the Mediterranean Sea is a big body of salt water, don't get me wrong, but a third of the ships in the world have to be taken out. I mean, a third of the ships aren't in the Mediterranean Sea. They might be in the Pacific, but this gigantic body of salt water, boom, this thing hits in there, and as soon as this hits in there, it doesn't say, and the sea became like blood. It says, it became blood. You say, is there any precedence for that? Well, yeah, when Moses said, let my people go, and Pharaoh laughed and said, you ain't going nowhere, and he waved that rod over that river, and it became blood, not like blood, didn't look like blood, wasn't some red algae, something or another. It became blood. Well, when the second trumpet sounds, man, here the, a third of the ocean becomes blood and a third of the living creatures can't live in an environment of bloody blood, not water. And so they turn belly up and float up in the ocean and the sea lions and, and the seals and the dolphins and every kind of creature of, 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 of marine life are dead, are dead. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. You say, man, a third of the ships? What in the world? Have any of you ever heard of a tsunami? Man, we have tsunami warnings now. We all know what a tsunami is. A tsunami is like if you drop a pebble in the rock and it starts a little ripple, that ripple goes out away, and as it goes out away, that ripple rises and rises and rises. So out here, where right here, it might have been a little beep, by the time it gets a 1,000 miles that way, that thing's 50 feet high. And it just swamps everything. Can you imagine you're on a ship and a 50-foot wall of water all of a sudden just comes whoosh, and just covers you? I mean, you know, a lot of the things about the uh, Bermuda Triangle and all that kind of stuff, a lot of the things they say about ships being lost there and some of the stuff even on the Great Lakes, Lawrence, I saw a little deal. These, they're called rogue waves. They're caused by the way wave movement happens and sometimes it doesn't line up just right and all of a sudden, out of a clear blue day, no tsunami, just a rogue wave, just 50 feet high. <laughs> and and it, just, it, it just devastates it. the ships. And the Bible says when this mountain hits in that sea, a third of the ships that are out on that sea are just wiped off the face of the earth. Whoo! Fun times, right? Let's do some of that. Let's have a party with the devil. Let me show you some prophecy about this. Hosea saw this. Let me give it to you. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Sounds pretty contemporary, right? Therefore, listen to this. Therefore, now Hosea's writing, I mean, like Joel, uh, thousands of years before Jesus came, guys. Man, can you imagine the people hearing this going, what is he talking about? Therefore, the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beast of the field and the birds of the air. Notice, and even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Hosea says, what is this, God? Write it down, buddy. And he writes it down, and everybody that reads it go, what in the world could that be talking about? Well, it's prophecy. God telling us in advance what's going to happen on this earth long before it happens, and Isaiah rings in, for the day of the Lord, this is Isaiah the prophet, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty. Sounds like those prayers that you've been praying for get answered, right? <laughs> oh, they can't be answered in a day of grace. God can't strike them with leprosy and give them strokes and, you know, burn them with hot grease and stuff. I mean, these, these are the days of grace, man. But when the days of judgment get here, buddy, those prayers have a chance is all I'm saying to you. And God's going to bring down the proud and the lofty and upon everything lifted up and it shall be brought low. Look here. And up, upon all the ships of Tarshish and all the beautiful boats. Can you imagine somebody listening to Isaiah and he says, the ships of Tarshish and all the beautiful boats. What, what, what? I'm thinking beautiful boats, yachts, 
uh, great schooners. I'm talking about all these big, expensive uh, mansion boats and all these great, and, uh, costly, you know, beautiful uh, 200, 400 foot yachts and all these fancy uh, ships and boats and stuff that all these sheiks and Arabs and crazy rock stars and idiot actors and all that drive, uh, float around in. Boom, man, third of them gone. And Isaiah said, all the ships of Tarshish. Who is Tarshish? Tarshish is, the, is, is equivalent with Great Britain and that part of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the continent of Asia. It was the Tarshish tin land that Jonah got on to run away from God. So he's talking about all the ships of the Western powers. The rest, you know, we, are, we're, we came from Britain. I mean, our country did for the most part. We, our, our immigrants, a lot of them came out of Asia. Uh, we, are, we, are a, we are a satellite of Great Britain. Uh, a lot of places are. Anyway, don't get lost in all that. But, but the point is, Isaiah saw all of that, and he says, it's going to happen, and it's going to be tough. And then a banished star, and I'm going to real quick, let me just give it, and a third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. Notice it said, uh, 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 John says, it looks, like, it looks like a star that's on fire, <laughs> like a torch. Think uh, comet. Think comet. You know, we, we see a lot of sh what we call shooting stars in the nighttime, and they're really not shooting stars. They're really comets flashing across the sky on fire, rocks on fire flying through our universe. But one of those rocks is aimed at earth, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. And the star's name is Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died because of the water. So according to the scripture, that there is going to be on this earth a, 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 fiery, a fiery meteor, fiery comet or something like that hits on earth. Now, the mountain that falls in the salt sea affects the oceans, the seas. This one falls on land and affects uh, pure water, affects uh, groundwater, earth water. Uh, uh, what, what am I talking about? Uh, fresh water, fresh water. The first one affects seawater. This one affects uh, 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 fresh water. <laughs> fresh water. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all got to help me sometime. So when this thing hits the earth, it evidently breaks into pieces. And it, as it flies, it hits into uh, fresh water sources. In your notes, I, I just kind of gave you an example of, of, of what that might be talking about. And it, and it would say like, okay... Um, uh, think of the Great Lakes or all of the rivers of Europe polluted at the same time. I mean, groundwater and public water supplies would become compromised almost instantly. Wormwood is the name of a plant. It's a bitter plant. It makes water bitter. It's not necessarily poisonous, but it makes it bitter. And who, Nobody wants to drink bitter water, and so there's going to be a, a water shortage. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pollute all the fresh water or a third of the fresh water on the earth. And then we're going to have water shortages. And then you're going to have to stand in line to get water. And then people are going to have to have guns and say, you ain't getting any of my water. And then uh, people are going to start dying because of this bitter water because now there's a water shortage and you got to stand up for yourself and you got to get your stuff. And you gotta, I mean, you think it was bad at Katrina with FEMA and all of their craziness, you know, putting a little, a couple of 18-wheelers uh, out here in a community that has 60% of the population of this city. And the people had line of cars all the way up past Highway 53 coming into uh, Crossroads uh, Mall down there where uh, uh, one single 18-wheeler with some ice in it. Come on, man. What kind of good? You think that was bad? Wait until this worm would hit stuff. By the way, just a little tiny thought. Worm, scientists have already seen what they identify. Now, I'm not a scientist. I don't work at NASA. I, I don't know. But if you Google it in, you can see what I'm talking about. Since the 1950s, the sci scientists have seen in the, in the, in the sky uh, a gigantic something coming toward Earth. Like a, a, an asteroid, it could be a planet. They don't, I mean, I don't know what it is, but the scientists have named it. Seriously, I'm not kidding you. Scientists have named it Wormwood. And they said, it's going to hit the Earth. And it's coming right at us. We're a bullseye right for it. And, it, and they said, Wormwood, and they named it. I don't know. Maybe one of the scientists knew the book of Revelation. I have no idea. 
It's just kind of interesting, and a third of the waters became. But anyway, so the waters were made bitter, and everything, you know, was, uh, was, uh, was made worse because of that. And then the fourth angel sounded, and a third, this one is one of the most uh, mystifying to scientists, that, because this is like, how could this happen? But a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day didn't shine, and likewise the night. Uh, all I want to say here to you, time is short, is that um, the, on the fourth day of creation, just kind of a little point of interest, on the fourth day of creation, this is the fourth trumpet, right? On the fourth day of creation, guess what God created? He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the first day, let there be light, and it was, and it was good. Second day, let the vapors above and the vapors below separate, and heaven and earth were created, and it was good. On the third day, he said, let the water separate from the dry land, and he pulled them out, and land and water were separated, and God said, boom, it was good. And then on the fourth day, he said, put the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky and let them be a light by day and a light by night and a direction and a navigation course and all that kind of stuff. And God said, whoo, that was good. And then on the fifth day, God said, let's put some fish in the ocean. Let's put marine life on in the ocean. Let's create some birds that can fly around in the air. Whoo, that was good. And then on the sixth day, he said, let's put some cows and some sheep and goats and let's put some earth animals on the earth. And then at, toward the end of the day, maybe God said, oh, wait, a minute. Let's, we got to make somebody after my own image. Let's get him down here on earth. But I, and ba Bacon got on the earth. <laughs> Holy Ghost, bacon. The greatest food on earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man, think about it. A pig, I mean a pig, man, a pig basically takes apples, which are, let's just face it, garbage, and he takes apples in and he produces bacon out of it. This is the world's most, uh, uh, the greatest recycling prod product I've ever seen in my life. We ought to, all, we ought to have, all have pet pigs, you know, because that way when they die, we can call our friends over and have a barbecue. <laughs> uh, I, I digress. I digress. My point is that on the fourth day, God created all these sources of light that are so endearing to men. We trust them. We depend on them. The sun comes up. The sun goes down. The moon comes up. The moon goes down. Tidal uh, surges, uh, tidal movements, uh, navigation, everything depends on those things. And then on the fourth trumpet blast, God takes a third of them and pff, wipes them out. You know why he did that, I think? To show you that the things that you trust in the most are controlled by him. The things that you depend on the most, that are touch you the most, are, are dependent on, on a creator and a sustainer. And he does that, and a third of the day didn't shine. Now you say, is there any precedence for that? Well, you know, the ninth plague that fell on Egypt was darkness covered the earth for three days, and it was so black and dark they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. I mean, God wiped out all of the sun, all of the moon. <laughs> Here's just a third of it, and for a third of the day, people walk in blackness and in darkness, and likewise in the night. Here's what Jesus had to say about this, just so you'll know. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's what Jesus said about what's happening in these last days. I, I'm just saying to you that right now, Jesus offers you the water of life, good water, clean water. He said, you'll never thirst again. One of these days, it'll only be bitter waters, bought waters mixed with gall. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, they put a rag up there, and what did that rag have on it? It had wine mingled with gall. And Jesus rejected it. He said, one of these days, I saw that a third of the earth, that'll all, the fresh water will be water mingled with wormwood, bitter, bitter, ooh, nasty. Nobody's going to take it in. So what I'm saying is you can drink of the water of life or you can drink wormwood. <laughs> it's your choice. Come on while Jesus offers you an opportunity. Why don't you stand to your feet?